before before starting uh, the last talk, I would like to profoundly uh, thanks Akram on behalf of the organizer. The success of this week is due to his help. I mean, he helped us a lot in many aspects of this week, and thanks a lot, Akram. And now uh, uh, we are ready to, to, to listen to his talk on dynamical sampling frames and inverse problems. Please. Well, thank you, Shabbat, for inviting me. I. Uh, I know that you have done actually uh, 99 of the work and you give me too much credit, but thank you. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about dynamical sampling, uh, frames and inverse problems. I will uh, explain what dynamical sampling is. Everybody here knows about uh, frames and inverse problems. And so uh, let me start by, um, uh, given motivation. So this, this work was, was motivated by some uh, papers of Martin Vettery, Yu Lu, uh, John Bruce Murray, Pierluigi, and others. And this is on wireless sensing network. And what wireless sensing network is basically you are, you put uh, sampling devices in space and you, uh, you uh, basically sample in time, space time, and you send all this information uh, to a central station and you try to uh, recover a function or some information that you, you are interested in. So this is uh, the motivation. And uh, at some point uh, with Ilya Kristol and Jacqueline Davis, uh, Jacqueline Davis was my student about eight, eight years or nine years ago. And we tried to formulate this, uh, uh, put a framework to this kind of wireless sensing network that uh, we, we were reading about. And so this is how uh, the dynamical sampling uh, essentially term started. And uh, since then, uh, I have worked with many uh, collaborators and students, and uh, here's uh, some of the names that uh, uh, have worked on, on, this, uh, on these problems with me. Uh, and some of, many of them are probably here today. So let me just explain a little bit, a very, a very general rough uh, idea about what dynamical sampling is. So suppose you have a function uh, of time and space, and uh, you want to recover the function h, um, essentially, or various, uh, maybe find possibly other parameters uh, that govern the relation between a function u from r to r, d to, to r and h, from by sampling the function u at some uh, sampling set ti xj, ti is time, xj is space. And so we take sample of this function u, which is related to h, and we want to recover h or some other uh, information that uh, relates to h. So this is just a very general rough idea. So, and so essentially think about a, um, an abstract initial value problem, which is here. Think of u dot is a u plus f, and you have an initial condition. This initial value problem is uh, on some Hilbert space h. This is generating of a stronger semigroup. And uh, we essentially take samples of u on some space-time pattern and we want to recover some things. For example, we may want to recover the initial condition. We may work, maybe A is unknown, we want to recover A or some characteristic of A. Maybe F is unknown and we'll, we may want to recover the, the source term F. Uh, so there are many types of problems in dynamic of sampling. And uh, again, so here is the uh, uh, initial value problem. And we have uh, sam samples, space-time samples. And they are like here, I, I put three categories of, of problems, the space-time trade-off. So what is the space-time trade-off type problems? Here, for these problems, A is known. The operator that's driving the evolution is known. Uh, F is zero. Uh, and we want to find uh, the initial uh, condition. 
uh, from these samples. And so, so essentially we want to actually find uh, sampling patterns that are kind of very sparse in this in the space. And uh, we can, however, uh, uh, sample in time as, as much as we want. The reason why we want to, uh, in general, have sparse spatial sampling, because this is cheaper devices, you can put them in certain location, and then you know, activate them in time as much as you want. So this is kind of called the space-time trading trade-off problem, because you are basically trying to, to, to not sample as much in space, but trade that, uh, but sample a lot in time. So this is, so you want to find conditions on these sampling patterns that will allow you to recover the initial condition. System identification is when, again, for example, this is zero, uh, and uh, maybe this U naught uh, and A are unknown, and you want to find A or some characteristics of A, for example, the uh, spectrum or part of the spectrum. The source term uh, type problems, uh, for example, A could be known, the operator A is known, but F is unknown, and we want to recover F from these space time samples. So today I don't have really too much time. There is a lot of things that we have done and a lot of other people have done as well. And so I'm going to talk only about uh, just a little bit about this type of problem, number one, which was the original uh, things we started with, and then the source term recovery problem. So uh, is there any question so far? Okay. So uh, let me go to the next. So, well, this is the, to set the notation a little bit. So G is a, is a set in a Hilbert space H. And this is, will essentially represent sampling in, in space. Tau is a subset of R which will represent the sampling time, the sampling in time. E is a set of the form, for example, a to the power t times g, g is in that script g and t is in tau. And this set of vectors is a subset of h and we'll say it's a frame if, uh, or semi-continuous frame if it satisfies this condition. Uh, and then of course we have the usual definition of just frame, which is right here, and the respaces, which is right here. So this set is either a semi-continuous frame or respaces or just a frame, regular frame, if it satisfies some of these conditions. And well, frames are 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 uh, are good for us. Respaces are good for us. So, but this is the definition. This is kind of to give the notation, etc. So let me now talk about, uh, about the, at least an example of space-time trade-off, uh, dynamical sampling. So we have a function, f in this case, h I'm going to take to be L2 of z. And suppose we have an initial distribution, the initial distribution or initial function at time t equal to zero is f. So this is here, the horizontal line represent z. And uh, we have a function lying at time t equal to zero on this horizontal line. And we sample this function uh, on these red spot. And of course, uh, the, 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 the uh, black spot right here, we would need to sample as well if we wanted to know all the samples of f and get f uh, to completely recover f. But of course, we do not. Instead, we we, uh, we sample uh, AF at these red dot at time t equal to one, at time t equal to two, a square F, and we are sampling here. At some point we stop, not necessarily uh, we stop the sampling in, in time, for example, at, at location G2 or at location G3. And, and then we have a set of, a set of uh, samples f at uh, time t equal to one, uh, uh, time t equal to zero, so these red sample, and then af at these red sample. And the question is, can we recover uh, the function f from this collection of sample? So this is the typical uh, problem, or 
uh, and we want to recover it, of course, in a stable way from these samples. So that would be a typical space-time sampling. Can we do that? When can we do that, et cetera? So to put this uh, uh, problem in, in, in more mathematical terms, so we have a bounded operator and we have script G, which is a countable set in H, countable vector. And we, we take A to the power T F, so we evolve F using the operator A. And we take now a uh, measurement at position G or these represent, so these uh, essentially are uh, functionals here G that belong to the set script G. So we take this inner product and we sample in time, we let T go in, into that tau, which is a set of sample. And we get a set of measurement Y. Uh, and of course the problem is, can we recover F from these measurements? The, and if you look at this set of measurement, and if you flip A to the power T to the other side of the inner product, you get that uh, this set is F inner product, A star G, A to the power T. And then you can say, well, I can recover uh, this uh, F uh, if and only if uh, this set here is a frame for H, so may continuous or, continu or, or just regular frame. But the point is then this problem of recovering a function from, uh, from its samples, from these kind of measurements, is equivalent to uh, saying, well, can I, is this set a frame or not of H? And uh, but this is actually very typical in sampling theory. So, so this is uh, nothing new, that's pretty much what's uh, usually there is a, a connection between frame and, and sampling that goes back to Duffin and, uh, and Schaefer. In fact, they, that's how they, uh, they, uh, they were talking about it. So let me, uh, then the problem of course is uh, we want to find condition on the operator A on the set of vectors script G, uh, the set of uh, uh, sam uh, sam time sampling tau, such that this is a frame for H. And here I, I, I remove the A star because it doesn't matter. We're just gonna think just of the following problem. Under what condition this set is a frame for H? And that really is equivalent to the original problem under what condition uh, space-time samples uh, allow us to recover uh, functions in a Herbert space stable. So this is, this is the problem of uh, space-time trade-off. And the first thing I'm gonna show you are some, some negative results. Uh, so, so here are some negative results. Uh, if A is normal uh, operator, so this is typical. You know, a lot of physical operator are self-adjoint or normal. So assume A is a normal operator. Then here is the first negative result for a specific type of sampling. So here you pick uh, any countable set G right here, but you sample uh, infinitely uh, many times in time and, uh, and, and uniformly, so N is bigger than zero. So this is a specific, uh, a special case of, of sampling. But here is a, a, a result that says, um, if you look at, uh, a to the power nj, where n is, take all the value n bigger than equal to zero, integer values, and j is, is in any set, then this can never be, no matter how you choose g, this can never be a basis for h. So you cannot construct basis of h for where, where an a is normal operator is this way. Uh, and of course, uh, that's um, the first, in some sense, negative result. And the other result, well, okay, so maybe you cannot, you cannot make a basis, but we don't care about basis. We really care about frames. And can we recover, uh, uh, can, can this set uh, be, be, okay, it's not a basis or a frame. In fact, let us uh, normalize it. And, and can, is this kind of set where we iterate a to the power n, a to the power n, apply it to a set of vectors and we let n go to zero, one, et cetera. Can this type of, of set be a frame for H? And the answer is also negative. You cannot as, uh, 
get a frame if the operator is self-adjoint. So self-adjoint and this kind. So, and there is a lot of operator or self-adjoint that are in, in physics and et cetera. So it's kind of uh, a little bit uh, unhappy. So, and in fact, if I talk, uh, if I look at the statement, we use self-adjoint operator and we show this result and the conjecture of this result should also hold for normal operator, but this is a conjecture and we, uh, it's an open conjecture. So that's now, what about positive result? Is it possible, at least for this, this type of cases? Of course, there are many other cases we can look at, but this was one of the cases that was interesting we looked at and it seems like at least for this type of sampling uh, and uniform and taking the integer, it's a problematic. And in fact, um, oh, well, this, the conjecture, I just wanna say that the conjecture is in fact uh, not true if you remove normality from this. And this is a very easy example. Take the Hilbert space to be L2 of N, uh, take S, an operator S to be the shift to the right, and if you take uh, this set G to be a single vector, which is a standard vector E1, then uh, if you iterate S to the power N against E1, you get an orthonormal basis. So this really uh, is, is uh, this conjecture and these things are tied to normality or, or, or self-adjointness. So let me go to anyway to a positive result. And uh, this is a positive result that uh, tells you, in fact, we do get a frame uh, if under, uh, under some conditions. So if you have a bounded operator A and you have a single vector you're iterating on, so A to the power NG, and A is a normal operator. So this is you are sampling in space on a single at a single point representing represented by G if you like, and you're taking iterate of that G for all integers, and you ask yourself is that a frame? And the answer is uh, this is a frame if and only if A essentially is a diagonal operator, and uh, all the eigenvalues are distinct. And the eigenvalues have to be uh, essentially be strictly less than one, go to one in absolute value or in modulus, and they have to satisfy this condition, Carlson condition, uh, Carlson condition. And if an operator satisfies these three conditions, then the, you will be able to find vectors G that will allow you by iteration to form a frame. And these vectors you have also cannot be completely, uh, um, uh, so the vector G here is um, the projection, the size of the projection is essentially uh, the same as the size of this quantity here that depend on the eigenvalue. So this is roughly, the three condition uh, that will allow you to, uh, to create frames by iteration against a single vector G. And this is an, an if and only if statement. The next question is, well, what about if we want to finitely many G? And we have a necessary condition. And essentially it's the same if instead of taking a single G, you take finitely many G, and you iterate on them and, and you ask yourself, um, uh, when can I get, uh, 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 ask yourself, suppose I get a frame, what happens? Well, for sure, then the operator is essentially uh, that, well, it's a diagonal matrix with projections. Now the projections have dimension more than one, but they have to be, uh, essentially their rank have to be less than the number of vectors in G and these other conditions must also be satisfied. Uh, so, but this is a necessary uh, condition. So what are the sufficient conditions? And there is those uh, essentially this plus a little bit of extra thing uh, gives the result necessary and sufficient condition very much similar to the previous result. 
And that was done uh, by uh, Cabredi Motor and Petrosu uh, and Philip in, uh, uh, in this paper that I'll show later. But anyway, so there is a necessary and sufficient condition very similar to the previous one for general case. So this, uh, there are many, many, many other results and problem. I just want to give you a little bit of the flavor of these space-time sampling. And uh, you can take the cases where um, you, you, the, the time samples are finite. You can take the case where the time sample are, are irregular. You can, take, you can take the case where actually you are continuously sampling in time, et cetera. So there are a lot of variations and there are a lot of problems. And some of them are open, some of them are not. Some of them have been resolved, et cetera. There is a lot of questions, but this is just uh, two that give you uh, two two results that give you some some idea about what these problems are about. Um, and let me now uh, go to a different type of problems, which is the source recovery, and I will talk about uh, uh, what uh, these type of problems are and uh, and just uh, one result uh, that we have had recently on this. So before I go on, is there any question about anything so far? Okay. Well, if there are none, let me go to now the source recovery term type problem. So again, let's think about the, um, Initial value problem, the abstract initial value problem, uh, in in uh, uh, some Hilbert space, and let's say A generates a C zero domain group, and T is a semi group that it generates, and so we have this this uh, the source term. We have this uh, initial value problem, and there are two sources: some source F and some source eta. And why two sources? I'm interested in recovering F in general. So what is eta? Well, eta is a background source. So think, think of, of your measure. So, so, so you, I don't know if you have seen these seismic device. You have this little needle and this uh, uh, little cylinder that's turning around and the needle is kind of moving around and recording vibrations. So this is a background source, if you think about it. And then if there is a seismic uh, event somewhere, well, this needle is gonna go wild and it's gonna go uh, and, and, and produce some sort of big peak. And so, so but, but you're interested in the big peak because with the peaks, you maybe if you have several of these devices somewhere, you could recover where the thing occurred, uh, when, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, well, et cetera. I mean, you can recover, uh, and the position where it occurred. If so, so, so there is a background source, so vibrations, uh, just regular vibration, and there are things that events that you're interested in. And for example, uh, sorry, so think of uh, the events that you're interested in are functions that are uh, so that are uh, kind of Dirac in time, so so they they are burst in. And FJ is basically the spatial, the, the spatial uh, 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 function, and uh, it's belong to let's say some Hilbert space H. So F of T is the sum of FJ. FJ is Hilbert space delta is a Dirac T minus TJ, and we don't know FJ, we don't know TJ, we don't know N, but we'd like to be able to recover them when they occur. So this is the problem, and what do we do? Can we do something? What is the problem? So this is this is the uh, the problem. We have this initial type value problem. Two terms: a is known. U not need not be known anyway. It can assume to be whatever it is. U zero or not doesn't matter. And uh, we want to construct. So the problem is to construct. A sampling set, a frame, if you like, G, a uh, spatial sampling set, and a time sampling step beta, we're going to sample uniformly in this case, that allow us to recover F in a stable 
way or at least approximate f and 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 not only do we have a background in this case but also when we measure how do we measure what are our measurement so our measurement once we create our set g are the function u evaluated at time t n n times beta which is beta we'll need to to find out sampling at position j by this inner product and when we do that unfortunately we have some noise that is unavoidable so there are two terms that kind of and of annoying here at least is this background source and the noise and and the question is uh then uh can we recover this part from this thing and we have obviously to assume something on the on the background uh and 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 somehow it has to be different from f and the, the main assumption here is that f kind of very uh is a lipschitz function with some lipschitz constant l and the noise have some you know uh maximum uh value here so this 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 condition holds so this is the noise is due to the device that is measuring that are making these measurements so this is the problem and and can we can we find a way an algorithm and a set g and a beta that will allow us to recover this guy under these conditions so this is the problem and before i go on is there any question okay so let me then go ahead and tell you a little bit about so we kind of solved this problem but let me tell you how i want to give you a little bit of the idea this will give you the idea of how and even the idea of the proof really at the same time so um first of all we're going to pick a frame so my function f these f sub j that are the the shape of the burst live in some Hilbert space or maybe in, in some subset of the Hilbert space. Let's assume, in fact, it's a, it's a whole Hilbert space so that we don't get. So I'm going to find a set of vectors G tilde in H that form a frame for H. That's the first thing. I just find one. It doesn't matter which one. Maybe we haven't thought about how to change that for particular applications, but we find one. So that's a G tilde. Then we're going to add to it another set. And this other set is what form our uh, the total set G that we want that we design so that we we will use to recover F. So that set is a frame, and we're going to add to it a T star beta. So every vector here we're going to apply T star beta to it and get a new vector. Beta is this fixed time constant. T is a, a semi group that uh, generated by A. T star is adjoint, so I create essentially another set this way, and I added these. I add these two together, so I have pairs. I'm, and now I'm going to measure using pairs. At every time instant, I'm going to use a pair, one from here and one from here. So let's see. Let's see why. So at any at instant time t n, I'm going to measure measure one make one measurement from vector in this set. And it's this inner product. And also at the same time Tn, I'm gonna use the cor a corresponding vector from here. And I'm gonna take these two measurements, this pair of measurements. What happens is that one measurement, this one, is going to predict what will be this measurement at time n plus one if there is no burst. So one measurement is to predict what's going to happen in the next time when there, if there is no burst, while this one is a current measurement. So one is a prediction, one is a current. And with that, so we can write this the equation of these guys. With that, here is, here is a little bit what happens. With this measurement at time Tn, if I compare it with this measurement at time tn plus one, if there is no burst, because this is a prediction, 
this difference should be zero or almost zero. We'll see why. So if there is no burst, since this is a prediction of the next measurement this of, of using G tilde, this should be approximately zero. If there is a burst, then this should not be zero. And, uh, and, and this is what essentially this says, let's say this is at time two beta, I have these two measurement at position four. So I make this measurement here and this measurement here. And the difference of the measurement at time T2 and the measurement at time T3 should be zero if there is no burst. And that is a key, a key thing. So let us take the difference of a measurement and the prediction and, and the prediction and do let's make this difference and compute. Uh, call this gamma, this difference, and compute gamma n plus one minus gamma n and take the absolute value. So this is, a, a, if you do a little bit of few computations and uh, you realize, so this is the background term uh, and this is the operator T, T star, the semi-group, and this is the, the maximum noise you can get. And if you do this computation, you get that this difference between these guys are simply bounded by this quantity if no burst in, in this interval occur. So this quantity uh, is a bound when we have no burst. And therefore, we're gonna declare that there is a burst if this quantity is sufficiently large. So what's sufficiently large? We can take that, multiply by some k bigger than one. We can decide what that is. And, and then uh, that will tell us at least when there is a burst. Uh, so if, so, so just to, to, to make things clear a little bit, this quantity, we call it the threshold Q. And now I take, if the, the, this threshold Q, if this absolute value is bigger than Q and between N plus one and N and between N plus two and N plus one also at the same time, then we're gonna be able to, to find uh, a value which is essentially the inner product of Fj, which is one, uh, the shape of the burst with J. That, occurred between these two intervals. So, and if uh, th this condition is not satisfied, we're gonna say there is no burst. And of course, that means this, this function fj is zero, but there is no burst. So, so this is the idea. And then uh, uh, you, you, with that and the, some extra conditions uh, that you can, you need, you get the following, uh, result that says, essentially, we can find an algorithm. We actually will, in fact, I essentially told you what the algorithm is, uh, that will allow you to recover approximately uh, a burst-like function as long as two bursts are, uh, there, is a, 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 there, there is a a gap, uh, gamma, two bursts cannot occur uh, so tj plus one minus tj should be, should have a gap, uh, should not be less than gamma. So once you have that, you can choose a beta, which is about a third of gamma or less. And you can find an algorithm that will allow you to recover the time of the burst, t tilde j approximately within beta over two. And the, the, uh, the shape of the burst uh, within, so this is the burst Fj, it's approximation F tilde J, this is what you find, those are the approximation. And that's with no, no larger than uh, this quantity here. So what is this quantity? This is the uh, step, uh, this, the time sampling step beta. So you get, this is, this is the Lipschitz constant of the background noise. 
This is this maximal noise. This is some constant beta that depend on the operator uh, uh, T, which is a semi-group, and this is FJ. So this is, uh, this is uh, the result. And there is one way of doing it, like the way I, I kind of, uh, this kind of predictive method. And there is another, so we, we had two, two types of predictive method. One that essentially what I described to you, another one that, that is kind of like prony-like algorithm. Uh, it's also a predictive algorithm. The, it's essentially give the same result here, but it gives a slightly better result on, on the locations. It is order of beta, uh, I guess here I have beta squares, probably should be beta. Uh, and, and here it should be, and here is beta squared. So we can get, no, no, sorry. That, sorry, this is correct. So Tj minus T to the J is, is of the order of beta. Well, t, tj minus t to the j is the order of beta square with this prony-like method. So we can get a slightly better estimate on the time location. Um, so let me see. I think I am uh, going to, I finished early, but that leaves us uh, time for questions if you have. Let me simply say, uh, here are some, uh, 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 basically some papers uh, that are related to what I've talked to and some others. So I will, I will go over some of them. Uh, so some of the results that I showed at the beginning about uh, space-time sampling are, are here. Um, then, um, well, here are some papers and from these you can find other, other results uh, on, on various of these. Some of, some of these problems that I talked about. Uh, the, um, one of the results that I mentioned about necessary and sufficient condition for the space-time sampling with finite, finitely many J, uh, this is, uh, it's here. Now, uh, Ole and his collaborators, and uh, more specifically, uh, Hassan Asab, uh, they have uh, also worked on dynamic assembly, but from a different point of view. And this is one of the, one of the papers that they, they, uh, they worked on. And there you, you actually um, take a frame uh, and you ask yourself, is this frame generated by the iterative action of an operator against one single function? And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so this, this is uh, the point of view of, of, well, the question that I ask, and they have many uh, results and uh, beautiful ones. And you can also check uh, that these and other uh, there. So I said some of these paper, uh, some of this work was inspired by paper of Yu Lu and, uh, and uh, Vitter Lee and others, and here are, uh, two, uh, two particular papers that uh, are really interesting from the application point of view and uh, also give you an idea about where these problems uh, might be useful and uh, can inspire uh, also uh, new problems. And uh, also there is a recent uh, uh, paper here uh, on, on, you know, space-time samples, uh, which is, uh, a beautiful paper that just appeared recently. And uh, thank you. And I think I will stop here and uh, I will take any of your questions. Thanks a lot, Akram. That's thanks to speak here. Uh, there is one question in the chat by Marco asking, is there an application in control theory of your results? Well, okay, so uh, this is a really good question because as we were working on these problems, we also realized that uh, what we were uh, working on was in fact related to uh, some control theory and particularly to some uh, to the problem of observability. Um, so uh, are there for sure uh, because there is a, a strong connection. <laughs> in fact, I believe that uh, uh, we, we realized that uh, eventually um, in some work, uh, well, let me see, there is a beautiful work by Nikolsky 
that is related to some of these uh, things. And uh, so, yes, first of all, there is definitely a, a relation and so the, uh, with control theory and therefore there should be some application to control theory, but we haven't, I have not uh, pursued that uh, uh, too much at this point, um, but I think others uh, have actually looked into that. So that's, yeah. yeah. And, Thank you, Ekram. Any further questions or comments? Well, if not, let's thank Ekram again.